Production funding for this program was made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through the Pacific Mountain Network Program Fund. Exploration and settlement of the American West were driven by a variety of interests, not the least of which was the spirit of adventure. Like a mountain, it was there, and many needed no more reason than that. The discovery of gold lured some hapless and some wildly successful adventurers to the Rocky Mountain Territory. Soon, railroads, with their accessible links to the frontier, brought thousands of others to see for themselves the romance of the West as glamorized by early artists and writers. Hordes of travelers made it worthwhile for entrepreneurs to build elegant resort hotels of surprising grandeur, and more modest but comfortable inns as well. The five hotels we'll visit still play their original roles and remain ideal stopovers for celebrating the charm, folklore, rugged settings, and history that so typify the Rocky Mountain West. For almost a thousand years, the Taos Pueblo people have lived near their sacred mountain and hidden blue lake. 400 years ago, Spanish conquistadors explored the area. A hundred years later, Hispanic missionaries and settlers arrived, followed by Mexicans, and last to come were the European and American Anglos, artists and seekers of a simpler life. The resulting uncommon richness of this layered culture is the setting for the historic Taos Inn in the village of Taos, New Mexico. A conglomeration of old buildings, which once ringed a small plaza with a central well, makes up the current inn. The well is now a fountain in the plaza-turned lobby. Four massive vertical vigas, timbers from mountain forest, reach two and a half stories into a sky-lighted cupola. The inn retains the thick adobe walls, arches, nichos, niches for artworks, and bancos, built-in adobe benches of the classic Santa Fe style of architecture. One of its walls behind a wooden stick coyote fence dates back to the 1600s. But for its 1930s neon Thunderbird sign, it could be mistaken for a private home. It was in 1889 or 90 that the flamboyant Dr. Thomas Martin and his wife Helen arrived in Taos and bought a house just off the main town plaza. Doc Martin was the only physician in town for 30 years. He is said to have been irascible but lovable and often accepted chickens and vegetables in payment for his services. It was in his home that his brother-in-law, Bert Phillips, and Ernest Blumenshine hatched their plan for the now famous Tao Society of Artists. When Martin died in 1934, the same year that Taos' only hotel burned down, his widow bought the remaining nearby buildings and with help from some of Doc's former patients, opened the Hotel Martin two years after his death. Later owners changed the name to the Taos Inn. In addition to guests of the inn, the dining room draws discriminating food lovers from around the country and indeed the world. Chef Ivan Walls, who prefers a baseball cap to a proper chef's hat, takes great pride in the innovative New Mexican styles of his specialties. For many years, the inn has been honored with awards for its outstanding wine list. Each guest room is unique, with its own working adobe fireplace. These charming fireplaces are hallmarks not only of the Taos Inn, but also of most of the original area buildings as well. Adobe artist Carmen Velarde has restored the fireplaces of the inn with a loving skill that is nationally recognized. She takes obvious joy in thrusting her hands into the mud and straw mixture and lovingly smoothing it out with strong turquoise bedecked fingers. Velarde demonstrates what writer Mabel Dodge Lujan called the sacredness of using the very earth we walk on to shape into a home. In the lobby are conversation areas where locals and visitors meet over Southwest specialties of food and drink. In fact, the Taos Inn lobby is a kind of community living room where on any given evening you could be rubbing shoulders with a celebrity writer, artist, musician, or theater personality. It is a veritable gallery of Southwest Indian 
Hispanic and Anglo artworks, an unmistakable sign of the area's creative multicultural heritage. Author D. Strasberg has been coming to the Taos Inn for 40 years. The same feeling is here. The differences are basically quite superficial. You know, 40 years have passed and so some things are different, but nothing that's of any real meaning to me. Uh, the mountains are exactly the same and the Taos Inn is the same. The feeling of the Taos Inn is the same, the quality of it. There's a, a sense of history here, uh, but a lot has gone on. It has reflected, at least for me, the spirit of Taos itself in many, many ways. In spring, the Taos Inn courtyard smells of Indian plum blossoms and is an inviting area for pausing to contemplate the cultures that produce such places of peace and beauty. Ethnic influences on the evolution of the Taos Inn remain in their original forms in the surrounding region, and one is hard-pressed not to notice and explore them. It's not difficult to understand how 16th century Spaniards thought they had discovered a legendary golden city when they came upon the Taos Pueblo in 1540. Earth, straw, and water shaped into huge community dwellings and maintained through a millennium still confound today's amazed visitors. The Taos Pueblo and adjoining lands make up a sovereign nation within the United States. The thick adobe walls and timber vigas of its surprisingly condo-like form are the prototypical features for many buildings in the region. The Taos Pueblo country originally comprised some 300,000 acres, including Taos Mountain and Blue Lake, where ceremonials took place. Over the centuries, encroaching settlement by outsiders reduced the holdings to about 50,000 acres. In 1906, the Forest Service established Carson National Forest, which included the sacred watershed. In a long uphill fight to regain their lands, the Pueblo people, with help from others interested in their cause, eventually took their case to Washington. R.C. Gordon McCutcheon, author of The Taos Indians and the Battle for Blue Lake, likens the story to Roman Catholics winning back the Vatican or Anglicans repossessing Canterbury Cathedral. And there finally was the moment of truth in the Senate gallery and the ancient Kasiki, the spiritual leader of his people, chanting and softly making medicine with the other spiritual elders, calling on the powers at Blue Lake to help the senators see the light and restore this ground to these people, this ground that was so sacred and important. And after the vote, when they knew they'd won, the Kasiki stood in the gallery holding aloft his old walking stick. Great theater. One of the most often photographed and painted churches in the country is San Francisco de Assis, St. Francis of Assisi, part of it dating back to the 1700s in Spanish colonial times. The classic view is... From its very beginnings, the Alex Johnson Hotel was dedicated to celebrating the culture of the Sioux Indians who had hunted, fished, camped, and raised corn throughout the Black Hills of today's South Dakota. The Teton Sioux, the quintessential Plains Indians, had by 1750 become an equestrian, buffalo-dependent group of tribes. The incorporation of their symbols and artwork went a long way towards the hotel becoming known as the Showplace of the West. In 1927, groundbreaking took place in Rapid City, South Dakota for the Chicago Northwestern Railroad's 11-story hotel named for the man who, after an illustrious career in law, had chosen not only to live in the area but had immersed himself in Sioux traditions. In 1933, Alex Johnson was made blood brother to the Sioux chief, Iron Horse. Johnson's striking portrait in the role of Chief Red Star hangs in the lobby of the Alex Johnson Hotel. Today's owner, Tom Didier, is absorbed in restoring the building to its original glory. No small task, that. For over the years, many of its early Indian murals and designs were painted over during repair or renovation work. Current preoccupation with authenticity led Jody Hertenstein, general manager, and Cynthia Day, marketing director, to seek advice on restoration details from a Sioux medicine man in a ceremony held for that purpose. Jody and I went through a Lawampi ceremony on the Rosebud Reservation. And we were guests of medicine man Elmer Running. And 
it was done in complete darkness. You could not see your hand in front of you. We sat there for two and a half hours and saw and heard things that are very indescribable. The historic restoration project that we uh, have begun, it, we started it several years ago, and it's taken a lot of time, research, and just getting mentally prepared to spend the amount of money it costs to go back and research and, and hire the, the professionals to do the job. So it, it started two years ago. It will continue for this hotel for as long as this hotel sits on this block, and it's something very challenging something that we've, we've learned a lot of patience mm -hmm. over and it's it's a very exciting project and I'm glad to be a part of it. Old photographs reveal that the lobby looks very much as it did when the grand opening took place. The large fireplace of native field stone with its wooden mantle still shows off the area ranch brand. Beautiful wood beams are anchored by plaster cast Indian heads two stories above the lobby floor. Between the beams are designs based on Sioux beadwork. An eye-catching chandelier of war lances is surrounded by a band of Indian symbols. Every effort is made to retain the Native American flavor of the Alex Johnson's auspicious origins. The presidential suite, now completely refurbished, once served as the summer White House for the Franklin D. Roosevelt family on a visit to the area. In fact, to date, four other presidents, Coolidge, Eisenhower, Ford, and Reagan, have stayed at the hotel. On the same floor is the bridal suite with its red heart-shaped jacuzzi, a far cry from the original, but still keeping with the tradition of luxury and comfort. During World War II, Sunday dances took place in the ballroom. Although the room's role has changed, archival photographs reveal that important features have been retained. Original murals remind visitors of the region's natural grandeur. Today's guests enjoy their meals in the hotel's landmark restaurant, replete with Indian works of art. The hotel's exterior, with its surprising English Tudor-style facade, has changed hardly a bit since the 1920s. Just outside the hotel, on the sidewalk, is the Getson Borglum sculpture of a seated, pensive Lincoln, larger than life-size. It was unveiled in Newark, New Jersey, following a speech by Teddy Roosevelt during his presidential campaign. No one knows to this day if the tumultuous applause was for the sculpture or the head of the new Bull Moose Party. Either way, the course of American politics has changed forever. Today, ranchers, honeymoon couples, locals, tourists, and conventioneers frequent the Alex Johnson. Dr. Jürgen Vickert from Germany was obviously enthralled. Then to be actually here and see people in the boots and wearing hats and see a buffalo and so, and also go to the reservation and talk to the Native Americans is a very uh, important experience. The Alex Johnson's realm is the beautiful Black Hills country with its national monuments and parks, but first and foremost, in the heart of Alex Johnson himself, were the Sioux people, their traditions and art. Johnson would no doubt applaud artist Norman Blue Arm, whose work recreates the traditional art of buffalo hide painting for the lobby. Other decorations and items for sale in the hotel gift shop reflect a great respect for the quality and authenticity of contemporary Indian artists and craftspeople. A living testament to the abiding presence of the Sioux people is James Holy Eagle, a 102-year-old grandson of Sitting Bull, born one year after the Wounded Knee Massacre. Famous for his dedication to and work for Indian rights and causes, he is the oldest living Sioux in the country and lives in a tiny apartment in Rapid City. Each morning he prays in Lakota, the language of his people. Amen. I pray to God in the morning. I pray to me that I'm happy and glad that he brought me alive this morning. And in the evening when I go to bed, same way. Just a short drive from Rapid City is sculptor Gutson Borglum's Mount Rushmore. The National Memorial was dedicated in July 1991, 50 years after its completion, which was overshadowed by the beginning of World War II. Daniel Wink, superintendent of the memorial, talks about its origins. 
The um, state historian, Don Robinson, invited Guts and Borglum out to Mount Rushmore to carve, actually a tribute to Western figures. And uh, that was in 1924, and he came and he looked over the Black Hills. At that time, it was a dream, and it was really not private nor government. Um, shortly after that, in 1925, the government actually established the boundaries of Mount Rushmore and allowed it to be created out of public land. You know, in today's day and age, I think it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to start another Mount Rushmore. Um, certainly, you know, times have changed, and I think it was an appropriate undertaking for the time, um, for a nation, um, you know, to really recognize its own heritage and really to perpetuate, you know, what we're all about. And I think Mount Rushmore today is, is a great symbol of our country, but to do it again, I think it probably wouldn't happen. Tom Griffith, author of America's Shrine of Democracy, is president of the Mount Rushmore Preservation Fund. It's the most colossal work of art in the world. It's America's lone monument dedicated to freedom and democracy. Borglum really attempted to achieve not a monument to four men, but a monument to the ideals and aspirations that shaped our nation. Guts and Borglum spent a great deal of time right in this hotel. He was known downtown as kind of a freeloader, quite frankly. He, he had a unique vision of, of what he was doing for South Dakota. And he knew that he would attract millions of people to this state over time. And that he wanted people to pay him for that now. So he would walk out of the Alex Johnson restaurant without paying. He would walk across to the Elks Theater and walk past the line of people waiting at the ticket counter and walk right in because he felt that they should pay him now. He was a great man. Also nearby is another mountain memorial in the making. This one, a monument to Sioux Chief Crazy Horse, perhaps the best loved of all the great chiefs. Begun by sculptor Korchak Chilkowski in 1948 as one man's dream and funded entirely by donations, the huge horse and rider will one day dominate the Black Hills landscape, ancestral home of Crazy Horse's people. Ruth Chilkowski, widow of the sculptor who died in 1982, continues the labor of love. It's been a wonderful, a wonderful life. You get up on Monday morning and you're just as tickled as you are on Friday. And the last few years, uh, the progress on the mountain has gone so fast. And it's such a wonderful way to have a project where you can keep your family together. By spring of 1991, the eyes of Crazy Horse were open and work was going on for the final shaping of the nose. As financial support comes in, the work progresses for the family and associates who are utterly committed to the completion of a project some of them may not live to see. A great way to end the evening at the Alex Johnson is watching the preparation of the house specialty called the Landmark Coffee. But oh, to savor the concoction, that's a whole new level of delight. The Alex Johnson beckons to another time, another place in the history of the American West where with just a little effort, one can imagine rumbling herds of buffalo and traveling bands of colorful Sioux families. Yes, they're gone now, but the spirit of their culture of yesterday and today can still be enjoyed at this showplace of the West. High on a hilltop, facing the spectacular front range of the Rocky Mountains, is the Stanley Hotel, its white clapboard building complemented by the high country winter landscape. Oddly enough, it was an Englishman, the fourth Earl of Dunraven, who first owned the land on which the Stanley now sits, like a regal overseer of Estes Park, Colorado. A spirit of adventure brought Lord Dunraven to the 19th century wilderness of the Colorado Territory, and he purchased a large portion of it for a private hunting preserve. Locals chafed at his hunting parties riding to hounds in their red coats and English saddles. Legal battles and local resentment eventually ran him out, and he returned to England in 1884. He'd had the right idea that Estes Park was a perfect vacation destination, 
but it would take later developers to realize it should be enjoyed by everyone, not just British aristocracy. One of those visionaries was Freeland O. Stanley, who along with his identical twin brother Francis was born in 1849 in Kingfield, Maine. Throughout their lives, they worked together on several successful business ventures, including the development of the Stanley Steamer automobile. In 1903, at age 54, his health failing, F.O. Stanley and his wife Flora came to Colorado. The bracing mountain air, sunny days and lots of rest did their work well. In a burst of enthusiasm for sharing their discovery with others, the Stanleys selected the site for a great resort hotel and bought the surrounding land which had once been the hunting domain of Lord Dunraven. In 1909, the sprawling yellow and red New England towered Stanley Hotel with its classic Greek columns open for business. It boasted Colorado's first electric kitchen, an elegant dining room with unsurpassed mountain views, and a lovely dark paneled billiard room. In the bright sunny music room was a Steinway grand piano hauled up from the Lions Colorado Railroad Depot by Oxcart for the grand opening. The main hotel was built as a summer resort, but just to the south was the manor house with its central heating system for year-round use, a smaller version of the main hotel. The two buildings came to be known as the Big Stanley and the Little Stanley. A third building, the casino, now called Stanley Hall, accommodated dancing, bowling, and a variety of entertaining events. Early conventioneers were brought from Loveland or Lyons by sturdy 12-passenger Stanley steamers called trail wagons. The history of the hotel and the steam-powered cars is intertwined and is honored by the designation of the property as an historic district as much for the importance of the Stanley steamers as the hotel itself. The steam-powered automobiles were easy to drive. Once sufficient steam was produced, drivers simply opened the throttle and the car moved forward. No clutch and no gears to be shifted. A kerosene fire heated the water. The original tiller soon became a steering wheel. The boiler and steam engine, which had been under the driver's seat, were later installed under the hood, resulting in the famous coffin look of the car. Ironically, the development of the mountain climbing Stanley steamer resulted in the demise of the once fashionable summer or month-long vacation. It soon became very easy to come and go for shorter stays. The Stanley Hotel stands out perhaps in all of the Front Range Rockies as an architectural anomaly. Most resorts are either rustic, known as Rocky Mountain Stick, or the Swiss-inspired chalet styles. Kurt Buckholtz is executive director of the Rocky Mountain Nature Association. And of course the Stanley was the classiest resort in the, in the Rocky Mountains at that point. Uh, and, uh, and I think the Stanley also then spawned quite a number of other smaller resorts, not only here in Estes Park, but um, actually on both sides of the mountains here. Uh, because people, uh, when they're staying that long, they can really get out and explore the territory. And uh, so hiking and horse riding, uh, those kinds of outdoor activities uh, were really what made the Stanley a, a fashionable resort and, and uh, one that would have um, the kind of um, uh, uh, interest to allow people to explore the Rocky Mountains. Winter's charm in the Rockies can be viewed from the vantage of the Stanley Hotel's fan-lighted front windows, which look to the west. Directly across the valley is Long's Peak in Rocky Mountain National Park. It is the northernmost of Colorado's 54 peaks over 14,000 feet. Glaciers carved its distinctive four-sided summit, leaving an easily recognized landmark with its celebrated notch. Summit registers have been kept since 1915, and the records show well over 100,000 climbers have reached the top. The Stanley is a natural stopping place for those wishing to roam this high country wonderland. Jim Thompson is the park superintendent. He is sometimes referred to as God because of his spectacular domain. Well, this park was established, of course, in 1915, before there was a National Park Service. Uh, it was about the 10th National Park, and it was one of a handful that were established prior to the establishment of the National Park Service. If you look at who visits this park, about half of the people are from Colorado. And the other half, of course, from across the country, but the majority comes from the Midwest and from Texas and Oklahoma. And for those people, the opportunity to go to high altitudes, cool weather in the middle of the summer, 
and to see snow uh, in the middle of the summer, uh, the permanent snow banks that uh, are up there at 11, 12,000 feet is a unique experience. The wildlife, the um, climate, the wildflowers of the, of the tundra, all of those things are an attraction that uh, they just can't experience to the same degree elsewhere. The Stanley, like so many venerable buildings down through history, has its share of ghost stories. Ever since Stephen King wrote The Shining, tales have proliferated. King got his initial inspiration for the book at the Stanley. The hotel's former general manager, Harry Graham, chose a proper setting to tell about the experience of two employees working late one night. She came out in the lobby and uh, they heard music coming from this room. And the only light on in the room was the light on this alcove. And of course the piano is here and you'll, you probably all know about the Steinway, which was a, a gift from Stanley to his wife when the hotel opened. Uh, so they, they walked up and they realized that the music was indeed coming from the piano. And from just outside the music room, looking in, they could see the keys on the piano moving. And of course, it's not a player piano, and there was nobody in here. And as soon as they stepped over the threshold into the room, the music stopped. The enormous responsibility for restoring, maintaining, and refurbishing an historic hotel, especially one the size of the Stanley, is not a job for a dilettante or amateur. Marketing manager Patricia Maher remembers what it looked like when she first arrived. I began my work at the Stanley in January of 1982. The hotel was closed down. There were hundreds of breaks in the pipes, no plumbing. Thieves had stolen a lot of the antique furniture. Uh, icicles had formed on the inner walls of the hotel. I never truly believed when the owner said that we would be open by May, but indeed, we were. A typical guest of the Stanley can be anyone from a, a, a group, national leadership on aging, U.S. West, to uh, people celebrating their 50th, 60th anniversary. They were married here. They've come back here. We've had people come back who have, were bellmen in 1912 and are now millionaires on Wall Street. And just the average person who is a little sick of the ordinary. Present owners of the Stanley are Frank and Judith Normally. They are passionately dedicated to preserving the grand old lady, as the hotel is sometimes called. Of course, I didn't know it didn't have heat, and I didn't know about 1,200 windows broken or cracked, and I didn't know a lot of things. Uh, this is a very, very special property. It's not just a historic property. This is a very, very special historic property. So I guess that in our ownership of the Stanley Hotel, I think that the Stanley Hotel far more dignifies us than we dignify it, although people say it's a mutual type of thing. New fallen snow gives the elegant lobby a bright, cheery glow. The focal point is the lovely, inviting staircase with its curved balustrades and gleaming white woodwork. One cannot help thinking of the early guest who in 1912 called the hotel a veritable palace in the wild. Over one of the fireplaces is a print from a Bierstadt painting, a scene that in real life is just a short distance from the hotel. Old photographs in the lobby are reminders that this historic charmer began with elegance and comfort. Freeland O. Stanley remains somewhat of an enigma in history. There are not many photographs of this man who helped to revolutionize photographic processes, but one is evidence that he did not take himself too seriously. King Stanley is sitting on a tree stump throne, a lard bucket crown on his head, and a broom handle scepter in his hand. Along with naturalist Enos Mills, shown here on the left, Stanley enthusiastically supported the establishment of Rocky Mountain National Park and assisted in the reintroduction of wildlife, which had been depleted by overhunting. F. O. Stanley died at 91 in 1940 in Newton, Massachusetts, his longtime winter home but he left behind the luxurious resort he had created in the rugged beauty of its natural setting. It is the site of an annual Memorial Day gathering of Stanley steamers and other old timers which arrive via the old route up through the canyons to celebrate triumphs of other times.
the Stanley is a gracious reminder not only of enduring grandeur, but also of the need we all have to taste the beauty of nature and one man's effort to allow us to do so in comfortable wonder. In 1902, a beautiful young woman named Irma was engaged to be married. She was known as a fine horsewoman, and her father was understandably proud of her. His elegant new hotel, named for her, was just about finished, so he made its grand opening an engagement party for her. This was no ordinary event in the still wild equality state of Wyoming, for Irma was the only surviving daughter of Colonel William Buffalo Bill Cody, Pony Express rider, Army Scout, originator and star of the world famous Wild West Show and founder of the town of Cody. Plans for the hotel had called for a classic Italianate building, but when it opened in 1902, it was luxurious and up-to-date, but somewhat scaled down from the architect's early conception. It quickly became the center of social life in Cody, where ranchers, tourists, business people, and townspeople gathered. To understand why and how this historic hotel came to be, it is necessary to take a look at the life of the famous man who built it. In 1867, William F. Cody was 21, and he already had a reputation as a cavalryman and a scout. He was hired by the Kansas Pacific Railroad to supply 12 buffalo a day for food for the men laying track. He shot from the saddle at a gallop with his 50 caliber single shot Springfield rifle he called Lucretia Borgia. His spectacular riding and shooting earned him the name Buffalo Bill. Paul Fees is the curator of the Buffalo Bill Historical Center in Cody. Everything he did uh, to bring the West to the East in show business was seen as the truth. So when he started his Wild West show a few years later and took it on the road, uh, people flocked to it as if it were not only entertaining, which it must have been, but also because it was, it was uh, as one newspaper put it, a show of the truth as it was. In 1883, Cody's first full-scale Wild West exhibition opened in Omaha. For the next 30 years, audiences in the U.S. and Europe saw live buffalo and elk, Indians, bronco-busting cowboys, sharpshooters, stagecoaches, and pony express riders in extravaganzas of Western adventure, always featuring an appearance by Buffalo Bill himself. Over 600 cast members and 500 animals rode the Wild West trains crisscrossing the country. But Cody's first love was the West itself, and he invested heavily in it. Buffalo Bill and his buddies put an awful lot of money into canals, and they tried to persuade the government to build a dam, something that happened years later. Uh, finally, he decided what was needed was uh, a hotel and a railroad. An analogy for the kind of investment, I think, in a town nowadays would be to build a domed stadium, for example. To build a place like the Irma, which in its day was a true palace in a place like Cody, was a real investment in the future. And, uh, and, uh, and yet it was, uh, it was his optimism, it was his way of expressing a certainty that the town would grow. Buffalo Bill died in Denver in 1917 and was buried nearby on Lookout Mountain, although the year before his death, he had led a party to the top of Cedar Mountain in Cody and chosen his burial place. Today at the top of Cedar Mountain is the sculpture of a lone buffalo marking the spot. From this vantage point is a splendid view of the Bighorn Basin and Shoshone River Valley he loved so well. The Irma Hotel is a fitting tribute to the Cody legacy. A huge bar room now serves as the main dining room where guests, townspeople, cowboys, and well-heeled business people still gather. One artist refers to it as his office. Hearty, reasonable meals cater to visitors as well as the ever-present local working cowhands with their man-sized appetites. As a matter of fact, it's easy to get the feeling you're an extra on a Western movie set. Upstairs in the old Buffalo Bill suite, the famous man's grandson, Bill Cody, spoke of his early memories. Well, you know, I was only four years old when he passed away in 1917. But uh, I remember him a little. I remember right here at the hotel one time. And then I remember him on his deathbed, and I remember the funeral. And that's, what, that's just about all I, my personal recollection of Granddad. And I remember Cody and the road up the park. It was the wagon train going up there. Streets were all muddy and 
board sidewalks and a uh, few people had chug along cars, but mostly they went horseback and wagons up to Yellowstone in the early day when I was a kid. And there's been a great change. By far the best known feature of the Irma is its magnificent cherry wood back bar. Some say it was a gift from Queen Victoria to Buffalo Bill, and some say Cody commissioned it himself in France. Anyway, it was shipped to New York from France, transported by train to Red Lodge, Montana, and the rest of the way to Cody by a wagon. Doug Greenway is the current owner and manager of the Irma Hotel. I think its role is the leading downtown building in Cody, Wyoming. It is the local gathering place, the cowboys, the bankers, the attorneys. This is the spot they want to meet. That's what I want it to be. There are many reminders of the Irma's odd combination Victorian and Wild West past. This is an original doorknob. The night that the uh, Irma had its grand opening, all the doorknobs disappeared as souvenirs, so they had to replace them. And over the years, one of the owners got tired of replacing doorknobs, so we're back to generic doorknobs. But as you can see, it's a, a gold buffalo head on a, on a cast doorknob. So it's very obvious why people want to steal them. So, you know, you'd rent a room, and the guy'd show up in the room, couldn't get in because he didn't have a doorknob. Wild parties were not unusual. One of them in the 1920s resulted in bullet holes in the ballroom's tin ceiling, a tempting target for exuberant gun-toting cowboys. Much of the original ceiling has been replaced, but a bit of it remains in the hallway. Bob Edgar, archaeologist, artist, and historian, has made the history of the area his specialty. Indians have been in this region for at least 12,000 years. Of course, the valleys mountains were just full of big game big herds of buffalo and elk, mountain sheep, and, and a wonderful hunting country for the Indians that were in here. It was just a, almost a Shangri-La for the Indians at that time. And the first white men in here, the Lewis and Clark, of course, went down the river in 1806. One of the most ambitious and authentic attempts to portray the American West of the 1800s and early 1900s is Trail Town the brainchild of Bob and Terry Edgar. They have brought 26 historic buildings to the site Buffalo Bill and his partner surveyed for the town of Cody in 1885. The old wagon trail can still be made out between the rows of cabins, each with its own story and its larger-than-life characters. At the other end of the street is the hole-in-the-wall cabin. The hole-in-the-wall was a hideout of several bands of outlaws in the Old West. And the last group that used the hole in the wall as a hideout was Butch Cassidy and what became known as the Hole in the Wall Gang. This was the best cabin that survived in the region when we went in there and we were able to obtain it from the Taylor Ranch and the Hole in the Wall and bring it here to set it up about like it probably was then. Trail Town has a feeling of reality. No blinking neon signs or come-ons announce the presence of this remnant of American history. You have to care about the subject, and then you'll find it. A step back in time, lovingly reconstructed by the Edgars, who continue to save a precious heritage. Cody, Wyoming, calls itself the rodeo capital of the world. Nightly rodeos take place from June through August in the Cody Stampede Grounds. Cowboys from all over the country compete in those most American of sports, bronc busting, steer wrestling, bull riding, and calf roping. Little cow hands compete, too. In the chapel of Cody's Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a much-visited mural and memorial gallery to the thousands of Mormon pioneers who braved frontier hardships on their trek west to find a place where they could worship in peace. Persecuted all along the way and forced to leave home after home, they finally arrived at the Great Salt Lake in 1847. The paintings depict moments in the history of these people who typified all those early Americans who sought freedom of religion. William F. Cody as the scout is memorialized in a heroic sculpture by Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney near the historical center that bears his name. The Shoshone River, Hart Mountain, the rolling grasslands, the Bighorn Mountains to the east are all here today as they were in the 1800s when white explorers and settlers came. What are no longer here are the buffalo and the roaming bands of Indians for whom much of the area was sacred. 
The tribes were forced out with what Buffalo Bill called broken promises and broken treaties by the government. Fortunately for posterity, the city of Cody's magnificent Buffalo Bill Historical Center features an entire museum dedicated to the Plains Indians known as the First People. The center houses three other museums, one devoted to Buffalo Bill. The Irma Hotel, constructed of local native stone, still dominates downtown Cody, which hasn't changed a whole lot since its frontier days. In fact, there is no better window on the Old West than Buffalo Bill's own choice, the one he built for family, friends, and visitors, that they might be comfortable on their visits to the heart of Wyoming's Cody country. The Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific Railroad, known as the Milwaukee Road, built a spur line from Three Forks to a tiny town called Salesville in the valley of the Gallatin River, Montana. It was 1927, and the railroad industry saw a way to capitalize on the great public interest in nearby Yellowstone, the nation's first national park. The Milwaukee Road, sparing no expense, then built the elegant, spacious Gallatin Gateway Inn in four months with 500 workers. Salesville became Gallatin Gateway and a new era of tourism began. Guests arriving by Pullman cars at the inn freshened up, had a meal or two, and then proceeded by park buses to their final destinations in the lodges of Yellowstone. The inn, like the Milwaukee Road itself, was electrified and had a telephone in every room. The railroad referred to its Gallatin Gateway passengers as Galligators. Although it was sometimes leased, the inn remained the property of the Milwaukee Road until 1961. By then, automobiles and airplanes were the preferred modes of vacation travel. In 1987, the inn had its second grand opening. What happened in between is hard to believe. First, the bad news. The elegant old building not only fell into disrepair, but it became the site of a variety of damaging and demeaning activities. The good news is that the structure was never extensively altered. Therefore, its basic integrity survived. Catherine Rather and Bill Kashishian saw the glory that had been buried and abused and imagined its transformation for a new era. So they bought the inn. The overwhelming project of restoring the Gallatin Gateway Inn was undertaken with an almost naive enthusiasm by Catherine Rather because it really isn't so much courage as it was a little bit of ignorance. You know, you don't know what you're getting into. I'm not sure, though, that if I had to do it over again, I wouldn't even knowing what I do. But you go into it kind of blind. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, seemed like a nice project, and so my son talked me into it, and we jumped in. Mm -hmm. One thing is the people in the area are very loyal to the building. They've been very proud of it, and they hate to see it go down. And uh, it was overgrown and torn up and dirty, and they've given us a lot of support. And then also it's fun because People come all the time who worked here when it opened or who worked here sometime when it was in its heyday and they have wonderful stories to tell and they're very pleased and delighted that it's, you know, so that's fun. Rather's son and partner, Bill Kashishian, was faced with some just about impossible problems when he took on the physical restoration. By my reckoning, about 180,000 nails in this floor and they're all surface nailed and we had to set them all individually and then fill them when we redid the floor. So it was a... Uh, by hand job. It took a long time. Well, I bought 12 hammers and 12 nail sets and hired 12 people to sit on the floor with me and scoot backwards across the floor doing it. Um, just over my shoulder back there was a boiler room that was built onto the side of the building with a shed roof. And the man who used to own the place had built this boiler himself. It was immense. It was a behemoth. And uh, so we had to get it out of there. And I tore the building down off of it and we rented the biggest boom truck in the state to come here. And when we finally got it disconnected and ready to lift, uh, the boom truck started to reel it in, and the front of the truck came off the ground, and the boiler just stood there. And I didn't know how I was going to get it out of there after that. Well, we counterbalanced the truck again on the front and tried it again, and got it up and onto another trailer and finally hauled it out of here. But that was one of the tougher ones. I thought we were going to be stuck with this boiler for a long time. In early photos, the dining room can be seen set up for well over 100 people. An old menu offers a surprising glimpse into specialties and prices. The room is now more spaciously arranged for guests who come to enjoy the seasonal varieties of cuisine, often referred to as Montana's best. 
The Gallatin Gateway Inn's charm lies in the anomalies resulting from its railroad origins. Because few guests actually spent the night, there are only 20 rooms with the flexibility of singles, doubles, and suites, each one decorated differently and comfortably, taking the best from the old and the new. The ground level still retains the men's and ladies' shower rooms that served those travelers who spent the night in their Pullman cars. Where once there was a shoe shine stand, the space serves as an interesting alcove in the lobby, and although it is not connected for service, the original switchboard adds some historicity behind the reception desk. The lobby's original railroad clock still runs, and the bar is called the baggage room because that's what it once was. Over the years, guests left messages and impressions there. The old wooden telephone booths, technically modernized, still grace the lobby area. The lobby itself, with its checkerboard floor and beam ceiling, declares its railroad heritage. Jonathan Foote is the architect who painstakingly planned and directed the restoration project. He became totally immersed in making it happen. His passion for the grand old building has never flagged. And then you start that painful process of saying, well, let's start with a, with a dream, and then let's see what it takes to make the dream real. The artistic challenge was to try to bring back to life uh, the details, because it's the details that really made the building. And as we scraped the, the, uh, the timbers very carefully and found the etchings under them and found the, uh, uh, the plaster work, the color in the plaster work, the whole game changed. And the challenge then was to get craftsmen who really cared and could use a light brush. And this has been a wonderful, wonderful project from beginning to end. One could hardly find a more charming setting for breakfast than the east-facing colonnade, closed in during the restoration and made into an overflow dining area just off the magnificent lounge. General Manager Colin Davis has a special affection for the inn and his work there. Primarily the, the people. The people that we, I like that personally about the business anyway, the different people that I see, the different people that I get to deal with, but especially coming to Montana, we have so many tourists and, and people from out of state that, that are always wowed to find something like this in Montana. It's, it's completely the unexpected. It's like we have a very large bed and breakfast. The rooms are very important to us, and we'd, we'd certainly like to have more. Um, and we're actually planning on adding a few, but you get to a point where you want to be careful not to add too many that you we lose what we really have to sell which is the privacy and the, the personal attention and people like not having to share with too many people they like the, the quieter pace they want the luxury they want the ambiance um, and fortunately um, it's very affordable in comparison to probably the, the national average in the united states the gallatin valley is home to spreading ranches that reach out to the nearby madison range Pathfinders John Bozeman and Jim Bridger brought trains full of immigrants to the area when it was still home to numerous Native American tribes. In spring, field upon field of wildflowers bloom as if to bestow a new meaning to the state's official name, the Treasure State. Also known as Big Sky Country, Montana is somehow larger than life and a humbler of mere mortals. Fly fishing is a favorite activity in the rivers and streams that rush through the valley. Tim Foote manages to fit in a bit of fishing whenever he can. This stream is on Seaburg Spring Creek Farm, owned by friends and not far from the Gallatin Gateway Inn. Predictably, the area is a dream come true for outdoor loving people, especially those who fish or want to learn how. Many come to the inn to attend an Orvis shop endorsed fly fishing school. A specially built casting pond allows them to try out the techniques taught in classroom sessions. The Gallatin Gateway Inn, built originally as a stopover on the way to Yellowstone, is more than that today. Its proximity to the park still fulfills that role, but as a year-round resort, it now attracts skiers, sports people, and the ever-increasing numbers of travelers who are rediscovering the American West and its wilderness experiences. It would be impossible to overlook Yellowstone National Park in any story of the area. The Gallatin Gateway is 80 miles from the west entrance, and all along the way are the national forest, mountain ranges, and river valleys of Montana's high country. The great park, with its natural wonders, 
scenic grandeur and free roaming wildlife will always pull people to the region. The Flathead Indian name for the Gallatin Valley was Valley of the Flowers. The Gallatin Gateway Inn, some 12 miles south of Bozeman, sits all by itself just footsteps away from the Gallatin River. Almost castle-like, its Spanish colonial lounge features huge arched windows that draw in the Montana landscape. The enormous fireplace is the center of a conversation area. Visitors may arrive looking for a piece of American railroad history or a retreat in the vast Montana highland. What they find is a casual, but nonetheless elegantly historic hotel to enjoy and return to time after time. There are scores of historic hotels in the Rocky Mountain West, each with its special setting and time in history. And all along the way are the ever-present spectacular vistas of the Rockies, sometimes distant and misty, often sharply defined in stunning ruggedness. The Rockies have been aptly called the backbone of the American continent. There was another backbone, too, the people of this unique segment in American, indeed, in world history. Some of them built and visited the historic hotels of the Rocky Mountain West. Air transportation provided by United Express, operated by Mesa Airlines, your express lane to the Rocky Mountains. Production funding for this program was made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through the Pacific Mountain Network Program Fund.